So we've been going through the book of Ruth for Advent over these four weeks now. And uh, it's a beautiful story. It's a short story, but it starts uh, as a story with really profound loss and tragedy. Um, the thing about life is that when we're in seasons personally of loss or grief or pain or tragedy or even intense anxiety or stress, it has a tendency to shrink our perspective, does it not? Maybe you've suffered a great loss and you've even said in that moment it felt like the whole world stopped. Because in that moment or over those weeks or maybe even months, just everything else was a blur and all you could focus on was right, what was right in front of you. And that's true, I think, of, of many setbacks that we face is that we can easily lose sight of the bigger picture. And some of you that have raised kids, like when they're not sleeping, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore. And we lose sight of the bigger picture that eventually they will get older and they will sleep. Or if you're going through potty training, then it's like, man, I thought we were good and then we had an accident. And it, in that moment, you can lose sight of the bigger picture that one day, eventually, they'll get it. But when we're, ever, we're in the middle of something, particularly something devastating and difficult, it's so easy for our perspective to go, shh, and all we can see is that. And so as we have gone through Ruth, we've seen this. And so one verse that we love to throw around in those times when other people are going through it is Romans 8, 28, am I right? And we know that for those who love God, hey, buddy, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Like God's got it. Just don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. And, you know, when we throw it around like that, uh, sometimes it's cliche at best and just do isn't even heard. Or at the worst, it's incredibly destructive. And yet... In those times when we are able to get a bigger picture and a bigger perspective, we know that it's absolutely true. Number one, because it's God's word. But how many of you have already lived long enough that you can already look back on some of those devastating things that have happened to you or in your life, and you can already begin to say, I can see how the Lord has now used that for my good and for his glory. I'm not saying everything. There are things that happen to us that you and I will not be able to see like, wow, thank you, God, that was really good for me. We won't see that until we get there and enter into eternity when everything makes sense. But there's something about when we get a little time or get a little perspective, we can begin to see the difficult things that we've walked through in our life. We begin to see how some of those dots connect for God's plan and his purpose for our good. Is anybody here that could say amen to that? Like you've seen that. Well, that's what we're going to see as we conclude the story in the book of Ruth today, that, that God had a bigger picture in play for Ruth and for Naomi. But not only that, it was so much bigger than just Ruth and Naomi and even Boaz. And it's so much bigger than your life and my life and the life of local church. It's so much bigger than you and I can see. But at the same time, we are absolutely, every single one of us, a part of that bigger picture. And so, as far as I'm concerned, that is hope that I don't always expect. And that is hope that I need so that I can face the devastating things that come day by day, the frustrating things, the things that help me, uh, that shake my perspective, that get me so focused on the immediate and lose sight of, wait a minute, God is at work in this. So uh, if you missed any part of our story over the last three weeks, here it is on fast forward really fast. An Israelite man, one of God's people, has a wife and two sons. He moves out of Israel because of a famine and moves into a pagan area, a pagan country of Moab in search of food. He dies. Sons don't take mom back home. They decide to marry Moabite wives. 
and set up shop for 10 years. After 10 years, both of them die. They don't have any kids, no sons to carry on the family name. So mom is left with two foreign uh, daughter-in-laws, but mom decides I'm going back home to the land that God promised my people. She goes back, one daughter-in-law rolls out, stays home in Moab. The other daughter-in-law, Ruth, who the book is named for, says, you are now my family, your people are my people, and your God is now my God. She rejects her home country, all that was safe and familiar and, and easy for her. She rejects the gods that she grew up with and says, your God is now my God. They travel back to Israel. They have no plan to provide themselves for themselves as widows, as both of them widows now and poor and penniless. They are at the very bottom of the social ladder. They arrive back in town. People don't even recognize Naomi anymore. And so Ruth decides, I got to go find us some food. She goes out to the field, starts picking up some leftover grain that the harvesters left. And then she meets by chance this man named Boaz. And in a time in Israel's history where everybody was just kind of doing whatever they wanted to do, it was chaos, there was no king, people weren't following God faithfully, this man Boaz was. He was a man of integrity. And so he takes care of Ruth and provides for her. But then the harvest is over, and Naomi and Ruth are faced with what to do next. And so last week we talked about what is their plan, what are they going to do? And so Naomi tells her daughter-in-law Ruth, she goes, actually that guy Boaz you met, He's actually a relative of ours. And not only that, he is one of our redeemers. And so we talked about how God and his love and care for his people, generations before this time, had set up in his law for his people, his guidance and his instruction, this thing of redeemer. Redeem means to buy back. And so he set it up that if any Israelite was forced in a position to sell off all their land or to even sell them slaves into slavery to survive and to pay a debt, their next of kin, according to God's law, was supposed to buy them back, to redeem them, to step in as their redeemer and say, I will cover it, you're free again. Here's your land back, you're no longer a slave. But God also had this provision that if a man died without a son, without somebody to carry on the family name and, and the property and the, and the, the tribe and all that, then the next of kin was supposed to marry the dead man's wife and have a child with her so that hopefully a son would be born and would continue on that person's place in the people of God. So God had this all worked out. And so Naomi's like, Boaz is one of our guys. Potentially, he could redeem us and save this whole situation. And so that required Ruth to do something very risky. And she had to go and approach him. She basically asked him, hey, Boaz, will you marry me? And so last week where we left off is Boaz says, I will, but there's a catch. There's actually a family member closer in line than I am. And so I'm going to work this out. I won't rest till it's done. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to work it out. And so that's where we pick up our story today. So Ruth chapter 4, turn there with me if you would. This is the conclusion of the story. We're going to find out what happens to Ruth and Naomi is Boaz going to be able to marry her? Ruth chapter 4, it's right after the book of Judges. This is what it says. Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. The gate was the place where financial and judicial matters happened for that town or any town at that time. It was kind of like the town hall and the courthouse. So if you had a matter to settle or something to figure out or a deal to make, you did it at the city gate. And so that's where he goes. All of the elders of the town would be there. They would kind of oversee these matters and make rulings. And so Boaz goes, he sits down and behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. And so scholars tell us that that and behold there is another kind of tongue-in-cheek idiom for like, and guess who showed up? Would you believe that Boaz shows up that morning and sits down and here comes the next guy in line to marry with the guy that he has to talk to. Guy shows up, Boaz says, hey, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And the man turned aside and sat down. Verse two, and Boaz took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So now he has this quorum of 10 men so that they can witness what is about to take place. It's got to be official. Verse 3. Then Boaz said to the Redeemer, Naomi has come back from the country of Moab, 
is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders, my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. So Boaz is like, if you're not going to do it, I will, but go ahead and do it. It's your responsibility. And the guy says right away, I will redeem it. And so if you're reading the story or watching the movie, you're like, God oh, dang it. I thought it was going to work out. I thought Boaz was going to marry. He's going to. And you kind of have this letdown, and that's the beauty of this writer. The guy knows how to relate the story. The man says, I will redeem it. So Boaz is thinking, "Uh uh-oh. But Boaz is smart. Verse 5, then Boaz said, well, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So Boaz reminds the guy, like, oh, you can buy the field, and you get you're taking care of the the older woman who doesn't have any kids, so you get to keep the property. But he goes, oh, but there's this catch. Like, you also now have to marry Ruth the Moabite, and you have to agree that your firstborn son will carry on the name of the dead man, not you. Boaz wants the man to know what he's getting into. And so then the Redeemer, this other guy, verse 6 says, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. He's like, no, 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 that's a deal breaker. I'm out. Now you can read that, and you can think, okay, it could be he had a wife and kids already of his own, and this just gets too sticky. Too costly, he's got to provide an inheritance for his own kids, so now if he has to split it with this other, what will be this other guy's kid, it's just a really complex situation, too costly, that could have been the guy's thinking. But he doesn't mention that. The only thing this guy says is that he doesn't want to impair his own inheritance. Now, impair, the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into English for us. The Hebrew word that we translate here, impair, other places in Scripture, it has this connotation and meaning of being corrupt, polluted, violated, ruined, or spoiled. And it's very frequently used in connection with sin. And so in a sense, it seems that this man is saying, ah, oh, it's just too cumbersome. What he's saying is that I don't want to get myself dirty with Ruth. She's a foreign Moabite woman. I don't want to dirty my inheritance. For me, that's a pretty clear implication and illustration of racism. I'm out. I don't want to soil myself or my inheritance or my name by marrying this foreign woman, this outsider. How many of you know and are thankful for that Jesus isn't afraid that we'll make him dirty? Verse 7. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders, put your sandal back on. No, Uh, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to her sons Kilian and Malan. And also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malan, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. And so what just happened is a strange and not so sanitary way of notarizing a transaction. Instead of somebody stamping it that day, the, the dude would take off his sandal and give it to Boaz, and that was proof or evidence that it was a done deal. But what just happened is that Boaz has publicly bound himself to care not just for Naomi, but also for Ruth 
at his own expense. And not only that, he has declared that a son from their union will carry on the name of Ruth's dead husband. How many of you would agree that this is a huge, unselfish, self-sacrificing commitment? Boaz didn't have to do that. He could have done what the first guy said and said, I'll pass, and then it would fall to the next family member in line. Boaz wasn't afraid of Ruth making him or his inheritance dirty. Well, why wasn't this an issue for him? Well, there's something crazy about Boaz that we haven't talked about yet. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, where it gives the genealogy of Jesus, lists Boaz. And it tells us that Boaz's mom was Rahab. If you grew up in Sunday school, Rahab might ring a bell. And if you didn't, here's Rahab's story real quick. When God's people, the Israelites, were delivered from their 400-year slavery in Egypt... You know, Moses, and he leads them through the wilderness for 40 years. They finally cross over the Jordan River into the promised land, the land that God had promised that they would have and inhabit. And as they're taking possession of the land, there was this city, among many others, but this city called Jericho that stood in their way. It was a pagan city. It didn't worship the one true God. They didn't surrender. They stood in defiance to God's people. And so Joshua sends two spies into Jericho because they had to figure out how to conquer the place. So these two spies go in, they spy out the land, but then the the soldiers in Jericho are hot on their tail and they're trying to track them down. And so this woman who happens to be a prostitute in the city of Jericho, a pagan woman, hides the two men. She says, come here. She hides them up in the roof until the soldiers go. And she says, we've heard that your God is with you and that you're coming. And she lets them go. She helps them escape over the wall. And she has this one request. She says, remember me when your God gives you over this city. In that moment, Rahab placed her faith in the true God of Israel. And the men told her, you and your household will be spared. Jericho, not too long after that, falls by the power of God. The walls come crumbling down, except everybody perishes except for Rahab and her family. This former pagan, other God-worshipping prostitute is the mother of Boaz, the hero in our story. Boaz firsthand had grown up in a family with a mother who had known what it was like to be the outsider, but had been brought in by the love and the care and the kindness of the true God of Israel. It had forever changed Their home, it had forever changed her destiny. And so when Boaz, now as an older man, has this opportunity to welcome in the foreigner as someone had for his own mother, how awesome is that? Do you begin to see the Lord connecting dots? That this family just so happened to leave Israel to go where they probably shouldn't have gone and there's this terrible tragedy and all the men of the family die and yet in doing that, it invites in this woman, uh, Ruth, who comes back to Israel and God's like, I've got a plan. This is all part of my plan. So what happens? Verse 11, Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses! May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And so all of the elders and people of the city just blessed Ruth, this foreign woman. And not only that, they put her on par with Rachel and Leah, the matriarchs of God's people, of God's chosen people. All of the 12 tribes of Israel, the the 12 sons, most of them were born from these two women, Rachel and Leah, who also had been barren until the Lord gave them children. And so these are the revered women of the Israelite people that God had established his people in his house through these women. And in this moment, the townspeople say, may God bless you like he did Rachel and Leah. Like that is just, wow. 
And then they go on to bless Boaz in verse 12. And they turn to Boaz and say, And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Um, real quickly, there's another dot being connected here. Perez was the son of Tamar born to Judah. Tamar wasn't Judah's wife. Judah is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Judah is the ancestor of the line that Jesus would come through. You know the scriptures talk about the line of the tribe of Judah referring to Jesus. This is that Judah. It's a very similar situation to what Ruth and Naomi have just been through. Judah had some sons. One of his sons married Tamar. So Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law. Judah's son was wicked. They didn't have a child. God took him. And so Tamar is left without a son, without a child to take care of her. Judah was supposed to fulfill that marriage thing so that she could have a son to carry on the family name. Judah purposefully rejected God's law, rejected God's instruction, and would not do it. And so Tamar tricks him into sleeping with her to get a kid because he was unfaithful to do his part. And so you have this whole crazy family line of all of these people screwing up, making mistakes, being rebellious to God, and yet God is connecting all of these dots. That is the, part of the ancestry that Jesus would come through. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Remember, she had been barren to that point. She lived with her husband 10 years, couldn't have kids. God gives her the gift of a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. Naomi has gone from emptiness and bitterness to now fullness and joy. Verse 15, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse, which means she cared for him and helped raise him. You know what's interesting? Verse 15 is the only place in this book, the only place in this amazing love story that the word love is mentioned. And when the word love is used here, it isn't about Ruth loving Boaz or Boaz loving Ruth. The love here is the love that Ruth has for Naomi, that loving kindness, that covenant faithfulness, that love that says, I will be with you no matter what. And we're going to wrap up at verse 17. It says, And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name. This baby, this baby boy, this new son, gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. Obed, he was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. Jesse and David. Do you see some more dots connecting? This is David. This is King David, the great king of Israel, who just very closely descended from a foreign Moabite woman. Boaz is the great grandfather of King David. Without Boaz, no David. Without David, no Jesus. How many of you know that God has a plan that he is accomplishing? We spent almost seven months going through the book of Ephesians and we called it blueprint, pointing to that God has a plan for his gospel, that God had a plan before he created anything, that God's plan to send Jesus was already planned out before he created a thing, before you and I even had the chance to rebel against him. He already had it all planned out that he would send Jesus to redeem us. And so when we talk about God's sovereignty, that's a word you'll hear us say a lot, that God is sovereign. That means that he has the authority and the power over everything and everyone for all eternity. He's got it all. But when we talk about God's providence, 
We're talking about how he actually exercises and carries out his sovereignty in the day-to-day -day of our lives. What we've seen through Ruth is this amazing picture of how God takes these ordinary people making ordinary decisions, facing ordinary struggles and horrific losses that we all face, having no idea how God was going to weave all of this together, having no idea how all of this was going to weave into the sending of, of Jesus. And yet we see God's providence through it all. From our vantage point, on this side of the cross, where we saw how God's plan was accomplished in Jesus and his, his life, his death, his resurrection, all of that, and we're on this side of it, and we kind of, we have the completed word of God, we've got the story from beginning to end, we're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But we can look back in the Old Testament and see now how God was connecting all of these dots. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Bible scholars tell us that there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point in some way to Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, what he's going to do, his second coming, that hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus was even born, God was speaking through his prophets to his people, dropping dots. And now for us, we get to look back and be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Boaz, Rahab, what? Then Boaz and then Obed and Jesse and David, what? You know what's something else that, that I learned a few weeks ago that blew my mind? Where does this story take place? Bethlehem? Where did David uh, watch his father's sheep? Bethlehem. Where did uh, the angels show up and talk to the shepherds that night that Jesus was born? Bethlehem. Boaz met Ruth in the same fields that David was tending sheep a couple hundred years later, maybe. And then several hundred years after that, Jesus is born. Same fields. How cool is our God? Connecting dots with just a messed up people that continually get it wrong. He's like, don't worry, I got it. I got it. It's under control. The prophet Micah in Micah 5.2, 700 years before Jesus is born, says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, like insignificant, of the 12 tribes, you, you ain't nothing. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. In other words, that blueprint that existed before creation. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus is born, Isaiah 11.1, 1, a shoot will come up out from the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's dad. Who's Jesse? Boaz's uh, grandson. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Jeremiah 23, 600 years before Jesus was born. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. This is the name by which he will be called. What's the name? The Lord, our righteous Savior. 600 years before Jesus was born. Tying it to the family line of Jesse and David. And we got to see the groundwork for these prophecies being fulfilled in Ruth. Okay, so as we wrap up, something else we get to see as believers on this side of the cross is we get to read the Old Testament and see these dots. But there's another thing that, that we often call types or foreshadows, where we see these glimpses of these Bible characters that we have, real men and women who lived. We see how so much of how God used them and the character that God displays in them, how it reflects and points to Jesus. We see something in them that almost overlays over what Jesus is doing. It's called a foreshadow or a type of Christ, and like none of them got it right, but Jesus is the greater Abraham. Jesus is the greater Adam. Jesus is the greater Joseph, the greater Moses. Jesus fulfills where all of these others fell short, and yet all of these others that God has included in his word for us are pointing to him. 
Ruth is one of those. You're like, really? Yeah. What did Ruth do? She left her own family and people, all that was familiar and comfortable, in order to bind herself unselfishly and self-sacrificially to Naomi. And she is an incredible picture of what Jesus has done for us. What Wes read from Philippians 2 is talked about as the past where Jesus emptied himself. He left the glories of heaven to condescend and come to earth to become a man self-sacrificially for us. He bound himself to us. Didn't have to. He wanted to. Ruth is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would eventually do perfectly. And then you have Boaz. Boaz is the more obvious one because it even calls him a redeemer there. Boaz bought back the land and bought back Ruth and provided for her as her redeemer. The one who had position and the means to do it. But not only did he have the position and the means, he had the desire to. He wanted to bind himself to Ruth. The foreigner the outsider. And friends, that is what Jesus has done for us. Jesus did all that was necessary to purchase us back. And not because we deserve it, not because we wanted it. We were his enemies. But he did it because he wanted to. For God so loved the world, he gave. Christ moved toward us because of his great love for us. The dirty, the sinful, the broken, the estranged, the enemy, that is all of us apart from him moving toward us in love and saying, I will empty myself to bind myself to you in my loving kindness for you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this grand eternal plan that you put together as a display of who you are. That the love that you have extended to us through your son Jesus that we celebrate this week, Lord, that we're reminded of day after day in all of the things you give us that we don't deserve, this love that we don't deserve, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you have invited and called us to be part of your family, that we get to be part of this narrative, this winding, twisting, full of brokenness and sin and wrong decisions. And yet, Lord, you say that if we belong to you, you've got it. That your plans and purposes will be fulfilled. Thank you for this vivid reminder in the story of Ruth. And so, Lord, for those that are here today who are struggling, who don't really see the dots connecting yet, for those who are in a place where all they see is the loss and the devastation and the emptiness, Lord, I pray that you would lift their hearts even a little bit, that you would lift their vision even a little bit higher, that you would give them just a bigger glimpse of your perspective on the situation, that you have already done what is necessary for eternity, that for eternity, Lord, we're good. There will be no more heartache. There will be no more loss. There will be no more what ifs or whys. Jesus, I thank you that you are near to the brokenhearted. And so, Lord, if there's anybody here today that has not responded to you, who like like Rahab, had not yet put her faith in you, I pray that today would be that time. Like Ruth, they'd be able to say, this is the true God. Your God will be my God. I pray, God, that you would bring hearts from darkness to light today because of your loving kindness for us. In Jesus' name, amen.